Uh, turn to the book of, uh, of uh, Job, chapter number 38 with me this morning, please. Verse 1. Job, chapter 38, and verse number 1. You'll be reading from the oldest book in the Bible, written somewhere around 1,900 years before Christ. So what you're getting ready to read is close to 4,000 years old. That's a long time, folks. Job chapter 38 and verse number 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof? If thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. I call your attention to verse number 7. And... In Job chapter number 38 and verse number 7, he said, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. This is talking about the creation morning, folks. This is a reference to the angels that were present when God spoke into existence everything that exists in the physical creation. He'd already made the angels. He'd already made the cherubim. He'd already made the seraphim. He'd already made these spirit beings had already been created by the hand of God. But in the book of Job, he's talking about when he spoke into existence the universe as we understand it, as we know it, as we can detect it in our senses, can perceive what's about us. In Job chapter number 38, when the morning stars sang together and they shouted for joy, the angels were there when that eternal, almighty, invisible being spoke into existence. It just came into being before their very eyes. All of a sudden, before them, worlds expanded. Universes, stars, and everything that we understand of the physical creation just came into being. Now, as I've said to you time and again, it's very important to understand this. Nowhere in that Bible does it ever say that any angel or cherubim or seraphim had ever seen God in His purest essence. I can't say that they have or they haven't. But as far as I personally believe, I believe that he is re he's holding that until the time when this man of dust, us, who've been brought up from the dirt of the ground, will one day stand in his presence and we shall see him as he is. Amen. And so these creatures were present that day and then all of a sudden just busting forth before them, exploding before their very eyes. All this universe, you would have been shouting and singing too. You would have. It's, an, a mar it's a marvelous thing to think about the creation morning. Now we know from the book of Job chapter number 38 that he's referring back to creation because he said to Job, where were you when this happened? Tell me how I did it. What's it fashioned after? What's it hung upon? And all these questions Job, of course, could not answer. And he said to Job, he said, you've been saying a lot of things. You've been multiplying words. And he said to Job, the more you talk, the darker things become. The more you talk, the less we truly understand what's going on. And so it comes from God to tell us exactly what is happening. And my friend, I'll listen to him today over the voice of man. Amen. This earth, my friend, was made in presence of these angels. That anointed cherub that covereth. We call him Satan, Ezekiel chapter number 38. No doubt was present when the earth was made. And this earth has dirt. And the surface of the earth is covered with dirt. And so now here are these beautiful angelic beings, the choir of heaven, singing the praises of God. And now he has made dirt. They only know so much of God and what God reveals of himself. Could they ever know? Because only what God reveals will you ever know of who he is and what he intends to say. But now, my friend, the focus is no longer up there. The focus is down here. And from this dirt, God created man. 
fashioned his body, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And my friend, God chose to do this, and it was a hard take for some of these angels. He chose to begin to reveal the great secrets and truths of his wisdom and his will and the word of God, not through angels, but through the creature that he had made from the dirt of the ground. That's quite a thing. That's a hard thing for an angel to accept is the fact that from dust he had made a man. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And yet through that man and through the prophets of the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit of God moved upon the soul of these holy men of God. And they spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And the Word of God, the written Scripture, came into existence from the dust of the ground. Amen. I want you to think about that. Let that settle into your soul. Therefore, what we will know of God is not what some angel tells us. What we will know of God is what the Word of the living God says about Him until we see Him as He is. My, what a marvelous thing. What a thought. That creature from the dust, made from the dirt. And here you sit this morning and you're listening to me. And the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, he said, Ladies, he said, cover your head. He said, your hair is your covering. He said, be certain you do that because of the angels, for they're looking down upon you, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. So it's obvious from that that you are being viewed. You are being watched. And my friend, we're not alone in this house today. It's good to know the Holy Ghost is in here. It's good to know God is in this place. He said, it's the habitation of God through the Spirit. But he's not the only one. When the Holy Spirit of God shows up in a house and He shows up in a place, you can be sure that it gets the attention of the devil. Amen. A lot of places where there's nothing happening, there's no Spirit of God, there's no power, there's no presence. Do you think Satan bothers with that? The flesh will do its job. You don't need the devil to send you to hell. You don't need the devil to ruin your life. You don't need the devil to destroy everything that you ever desire to be or want or have. My friend, all you need is your flesh. The flesh is a corrupt thing. It'll never be any more than that. From dust it came, and to dust it shall return. It was never saved, it was never redeemed, and it'll never be any more than the dirt of the ground. From dust thou art, he said to Adam, and into dust thou shalt return. And my friend, you must look past the dirt to find the real man, the true man. What you are is what God put inside you. What you are today came forth from the presence of Almighty God. We never read anywhere from the book of Genesis through the book of Revelation, through all 66 books of the Holy Bible, where God ever breathed upon an angel. But He breathed more than one time on a man. And every time God breathes on a man, something happens. He breathed into that dirt, and He became a living soul. The soul of man is the very breath of God. God raised him up from the ground. In the book of John, chapter number 20, He breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And so the commission was given and power with the commission to go forth and whatsoever as they sang a moment ago we shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven whatsoever we shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven he's given to us that power and that authority and it came from the breath of God amen so what's the breath of God preacher the Holy Spirit of Almighty God and that's what we're about and that's where we came from and that's where we're going my body came from the earth but I didn't I came from him he gave me who I am, what I am. I will return to the one who gave me my identity. Hallelujah to God. Isn't that wonderful? It's a marvelous thing. But this was too much for Satan. This was too much for him. When he watched the man formed for the dust of the earth, and viewed what took place that day, saw the breath of God breathed into this pile of clay, and now a man stood in his presence, no man before him. No men anywhere else. No man had been announced. There's no problem. I have no problem understanding the fact that God did not counsel with the angels of the cherubim or the archangels of the seraphim and say, sit down, boys, at the table. Let me tell you what I'm about to do. No, he's sovereign God. He does as he pleases. And those that love him and serve him will accept what he does. And so Satan observed.
preserve this one that was made from the dust of the ground. And immediately he became his enemy. Satan is the enemy of man and he's the enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because from heaven above, the Spirit of God came down to the earth beneath and God became a man. My, what a marvelous thing. When God above came down to where we are and became a man. Hallelujah to God. Satan hates Jesus Christ and he hates you. <coughs> If you could only understand today the hatred that he has for you. He despises you and he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And the Bible says whom resist steadfast in the faith. And his method is knowing the same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And so Christ was born of a virgin and he came into this world and this world received him not. The man of the dust said to be created in the image of God. No angel, no cherubim, no seraphim, nothing has ever been created in the image of God. And yet the man that was brought up from the dirt of the ground was made in the image of God. When you get your books down, begin to read what people say about the image of God. Some will say, well, the image of God is man's ability to think. God thinks. The image of God is man's ability to make choice. He has a will. God has a choice and has a will. The image of God in the man is the fact that man can love as God loves. The image of God in man are all these characteristics and attributes of God which are true. But the image of God in man goes much, much deeper than what you do. The image of God in man is what the Lord Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago to restore what was lost. The image of God in man is what is all important about you as a human being. The Lord said in John chapter number 8 and verse number 44 to the Pharisees, He said, You are of your father the devil, and the works of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning, and so he was. And when Satan, my friend, winds up in the lake of fire and brimstone, those, my dear friend, that are his children will wind up there with him. And that image of God will be completely gone and taken from their being. In Revelation chapter number 9, it talks about creatures that come up from the bottom of a pit. And it comes up from the, from, the bottom, from, the, from the pit. And when they come up, they have all kinds of forms and shapes. And they're different from anything that you've ever seen before. When men die without God and go off into an eternal damnation and hell, the worst part of that damnation in hell is the fact that you lose your humanity, you lose your identity, you go out and completely lose the image of Almighty God into eternity without God, forever lost, forever unsaved, forever condemned. What a horrible, horrible thought. The Bible talks about Satan as being a great red dragon. Their worm, the Bible says, never perishes. The Lord Jesus talks about their worm as if it's possessive, as if it's part of them, as if when a man dies without God, he is as a worm. When the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross at Calvary, it prophesied in the Old Testament when he took our place and became a curse for us, that I am a worm, he said, upon the tree. He took all of the condemnation, very possible from God. He became sin for us who knew no sin. That meant that not only did he become the sin that we could Commit, he become what sin ultimately becomes. That the cross to pay the complete absolute sin debt for every last one of us. Bless the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless the name of the Son of God. Bless His holy name. There's no other name like that name. For nobody ever loved you like Jesus to become every dirty, low-down, stinking thing that you've ever done. The Lord Jesus Christ bore it in Himself on the cross at the tree. And so when they die and they go to hell, and my friend, I don't take, I don't, I don't, I don't like hell. I don't like the idea of hell, but I didn't make hell. God made hell. And it was made in the wisdom of God, and there's a reason for it. Every soul that winds up in the pit fully, completely deserves to go there. Amen. Don't go, friend. I warn you today, I warn you, yea, I forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him. Don't fear the one that can destroy the body, but fear him that hath power to destroy both body and soul. Your very essence in hell. And so it comes. God Almighty breathed on man. Well, then what is the image of God in man? That image of God is a wonderful thing. 
A man is not an angel, he's not a cherubim, he's not a seraphim, and they're not made in the image of God, but we are. This is why we make such a big deal about the difference between killing a dog and killing a man. You kill dogs, you murder people. This is why I'm so adamantly opposed to killing the unborn. Over 50 million innocent little babies have died at the hands of murderers in this country. Little innocent children, they should be safe in their mother's womb. There's a perversion taking place when a child cannot be safe in its mother's womb. Precious little children, now they have 3D imaging. Now this sonar, it's amazing how they've advanced in, in sonar technology and sound waves and, and all the, I don't know what all the technology they're using, but I looked at the face of a baby yesterday that was in its mother's womb and it was as if you were looking at a photograph of it. And it was still in its mother's womb, hadn't even been born. And the little thing was smiling. The little child was smiling in its mother. Why shouldn't it? It's safe, isn't it? It's in mama's womb. I mean, where would you expect it to be more safe than in its mother's womb? An intruder comes in with a forceps or with a saline solution or whatever method they use and tears that little baby out of its mother. God help us. God help us. That's why there is a difference between killing a dog and murdering a baby. Amen. Because that baby is in the image of God. What is the image of God, preacher? It's a marvelous thing. It's a wonderful gift. It's what makes us who we are. It's what sets our soul on fire. It's what brings us into this house today when we say, Thank you, Lord, for saving me and washing my sins away. It's what puts the soul of God into the soul of a man. It's what gives us part of Him. He has literally sown Himself in to us. He's given us something marvelous, great and wonderful. The image of God. Oh, how we ought to rejoice. How we ought to think about it. How we ought to say, my friend, my, my, what is man? When they said in Hebrews chapter number 2, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Why, he's nothing but flesh and bones. Why, he's as, he's as weak as they come. Paul said, this vile body, talking about how weak it really is. I mean, an angel's got you done in big time when it comes to your body. Well, what are we? Well, all you've got to do is get in the environment that the body can't handle, and you're dead in no time. But that's not you. You're not the body. You dwell within the body. And there's something inside you that says deep down inside your soul, I know I'm not the body. My body's getting old. My body's hurting. My body doesn't sleep like it did. I got joints and I got aches and I got pains. But I'm still alive. I still have God in my soul. There's the difference. What is man that thou art mindful of him? He's been made in the image of God. So let's look a little bit at that image, just a little bit. And I'm sure there's far, far more to it than what I'm going to give you. But it's not so much about the attributes that are obvious, but it's about something that he has to us, that we have to him. There's a reciprocal here. There's God touching you and you touching God. There's something God's put in you that cannot be done away with and explained away with. It's a reality. There's just something about man that makes him different. And that image of God is the main thing. It's all thing. It's everything. For when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, the Bible said in the book of Hebrews chapter number 1, He was the express image of His person. Adam's image was tarnished, though he maintained a certain degree of it. It was tarnished. It was not in its purity. Something had happened. The Lord said, the day you eat of this fruit, ye shall surely die. I was reading what a Luciferian yesterday said about that scripture. And here's what the Luciferian said. A Luciferian, by the way, is one who worships Lucifer. And if you want to find out what all that's about, get the tapes on from Sunday school this morning. And you'll find a lot about Lucifer. But here's what he said. He said, can't you see what a lie the Bible is? Adam and Eve didn't die. They live right on. And I thought to myself, oh, no, 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 no. They died. For that image of God inside them was the spirit of the living God. It was God's life. And that life was snuffed out. 
That spirit maintained their life, but that line was broken. That fellowship was severed. Something marred the image. Something came between God and man. Something sinister had entered in. He became dead spiritually. The Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians chapter number 2 makes it very clear when he talks about the difference between the unsaved and the saved. He said, you have to be circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of this flesh. Why did he have to do that? Because there's a separation that takes place for the New Testament saint that did not exist in the Old Testament. Once that spirit is born again, I take off this body like I take off a coat. Because I'm no longer the body. A clear distinction is made in the New Testament between body, soul, and spirit that you don't find in the Old Testament. And the reason for that is because the New Testament saint is born of the Spirit of God. John 3, the Lord said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. The word translated again literally means born again, John, uh, Nicodemus, of the Spirit of the living God. So if you've been born again, the image is restored. You're not completely restored yourself, but the image is restored because you're not your body. You're a spirit being that has a soul that lives in a body. And the body goes back to the dust from whence it came. But you're still that spirit that he talks about in the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 2. That the spirits of just men that are made perfect, that are perfected. Let me show you a little bit about the image. A little bit that I've got. What is it then, preacher? Well, there's something in man that is not complete without God. All creatures on this earth, horse, dog, squirrel, appear to me to be complete within themselves. There's no corresponding relationship with their creator. They're just alive. When's the last time you ever saw squirrels have church meeting? Well, you do, because there's something inside you that hungers. There's something deep, deep down inside your soul that money, stuff, things, vocation, avocation, places, pleasure cannot replace. And here is what makes the difference. He will not rest until he takes away something that's very important to God. Now you folks know what a mirror is. You look into a mirror, you see a reflection of yourself. Here I am. I hate mirrors. Lord have mercy, do I hate mirrors. <laughs> Woo! But when you look into that mirror, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> You're looking at that mirror. Well, think of yourself as a mirror God looks into. I mean, after all, if you're in His image... He expects to see reflecting in that image himself. Now let me say it right here before we go one step further. You are not God. You will never become God. We will never be God. There's only one God. What sent, he what sent, what sent Lucifer to hell was when he said, I will be like the Most High God. We will be like the Most High God by the hand of God created in His image. But not anything ever will a man ever become God. But when he looks at you, he expects something coming back. He expects a return. The Bible talks about Christ being formed in you. Heard it? But something's marred that glass. And when he looks into it, it's not as clear as it ought to be. It doesn't reflect like it should. There's only one that can clear that glass. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to clean that glass up. So that when the Father looked into the glass, He saw what He wanted to see. There was a reflection of Himself. What did He see? Pure love goes forth from the Father. Pure love returns. You know, no angel can love Him like you love Him. 
No seraphim, no cherubim. To whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. You can always tell your growth in the Lord as to how much you love Him. Not how much you serve Him, you think, in your mind, which is fallen. And you've got to be very careful about your fallen mind. But you can always tell how much you're growing in the Lord and how much you love Him. Pure spirit goes forth from the Father. Pure spirit returns. Spirit of just men made perfect. Pure holiness goes forth from the Father. And pure holiness returns. Pure trust goes forth from the Father. That's a little ways on down the road. Very few people on this earth, I believe, that the Father gives full trust to. He has a few. And pure trust returns. So in God Almighty, plainer words, has made for us something that we cannot attain. It can only be made in us. You need to understand the truth of the Scripture. He that hath begun a good work in you, he will perform it. You can no more clean yourself up and sanctify yourself than you could save yourself. That's the work of God. But oh, what a marvelous work it is. You look back at your life at no more than a year ago or two years ago or five years ago and you say, God, help me out any more of that. And you've been saved 30 years. But you say, Lord, I want that behind me. I want to go on with you. I want to progress with you. I was doing something five years ago. Thank God I'm not doing now. I was doing something ten years ago. Thank God I'm not doing it now. Or I was doing something twenty years ago. I was doing something yesterday. Thank God I'm not doing it now. That's called sanctification. Growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord. Aren't you glad he's such a gracious, wonderful, marvelous Savior? That when you were doing all of that, he was still your God. He doesn't cast you to the, to the heap quickly. When you go down to that potter's house, make no mistake about this. The potter that has that clay in his hand is well experienced. He's been there before. He's worked on many just like you. And he knows exactly what he's doing. And so the image of God in man is man returning to God. What God puts in him. Yeah. yeah. And what all that is tonight, this morning, I don't know that I can understand fully all of it. But I know that there's something about sanctification that's very important in the life of the Christian. Man must have God. You've got to have him. He's the answer. That's what you've been seeking for. That's what you're looking for. That's what you're thinking about. You've been hunting off into the occult. You've been running off into, into sexual pleasure. You're running off into hedonism. A tough stuff put pile everything around you. And you're still not satisfied. You know why? Yeah. Because only God can satisfy yeah. the soul yeah. of a man. And only the Lord Jesus Christ can bring you to God the Father. Yeah. A lot of people have learned the lesson about the fact that they need God. So they start searching for a God. But without the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll never reach Him. You can't find Him. You have no idea where He is. Man is lost. He's empty. He's a slave. He's the most pitiable of all creatures. But I'm going to close with this part this morning. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit of God. First thing He does in your life is convict you. Well, I say, preacher, I live in conviction. I get a letter from this man who lives in Iowa. He's a, pit, he, he's, he's a pitiful, he's a pitiful creature. Uh, he's been corresponding with me for some time now. He got married not too long ago. And now his marriage, he says, he's sick of it. He says that God didn't choose him to be saved. And his God's not my God. And God chose him from the beginning to be, to be condemned in hell. And there's no hope for him. And so his attitude's horrible, horrible toward God. As if there is no God. I'd like to say to Calvin and his bunch, what would you tell this man? What hope would you offer to this man? 
What could you say to him? Could you give him any comfort? No, you couldn't comfort him. You couldn't comfort anything or anybody. Well, he's not one of the elect. Does that keep him out of heaven? Show me one passage in the Bible from Genesis through Revelation. One passage. Just one. That says, because you are not one of the elect, you have no hope of heaven. If I were a Calvinist, I'd take that challenge and I'd find that scripture. Good luck. You won't find it. You mean to tell me then that the plan of God and the grace of God and the wisdom of God and the mercy of God can go far past my... Yes, he can. And that's what I would say to this man out there in Iowa that keeps writing me. There's something wrong with him because now he's lost his wife. He's tired of her. He's sick and tired. Conviction is not damnation. Conviction literally is the light coming on. God turns on the light. He says, you're a sinner. Well, I agree with that. He says, what you're doing is wrong. I agree with that. But let me give you the remedy. That's conviction. If he never offers a remedy, it's the devil condemning you. The remedy is Christ. The work of the Holy Spirit is to point you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Bring you to the Son of God. Second thing he does is guide. He'll guide you into the truth. He'll guide you into the truth. That's important to be guided. Today, everything goes, folks. The floodgates are open. This is a spiritual zoo that we live in now. Everything imaginable, stuff you never heard of in your life, is becoming mainstream. When you talk to people today about what they believe, it's all kinds of weird, crazy stuff. But folks, there's only one way, one road, one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Ghost, if you have the Holy Ghost guiding you, He may have to guide you through a maze. He, have to be, he may have to take you through a whole lot of junk, but he'll always bring you to Christ. Amen. You may be in a religion, been in for 20 years, but something inside tells you this is not right. There's something wrong. And it's the Holy Spirit leading you to the true Lord Jesus Christ. I got a letter a couple of days ago, an email from a man. He said, I was a Jehovah's Witness for a while. I was this for a while. I was that for a while. He said, thank God I've been born again. <laughs> Hallelujah. He'd been brought through a lot of stuff. Just like I say to you, I've said time and time again, for a lot of people, salvation is a journey through a lot of junk till they finally get you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Third, he comes to save. The work of the Holy Spirit is the Savior. You understand that, don't you? The Godhead works in perfect unison when somebody's born again. Amen. The Holy Spirit draws you to Christ. Christ opens the Father up to your soul. The three of them working together makes you a child of God by the power of the Holy Spirit who takes you at the moment of your conversion and baptizes you into the body of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit of God is the fire of God's perfection and He will take you at the moment of conversion. At the very moment, the instant that you believe, the Holy Spirit baptizes you, puts you into the body of Christ. And ain't a drop of water anywhere. <laughs> It's done by the Spirit of God. Yeah. Amen. And then, finally, it is the work of the Holy Spirit to seal. Amen. Sealing represents at least two things, maybe more. Seal, number one, is the representation of an ownership. This is mine. I own him. This is my mark on him. But then the second person, the purpose of the sealing is he is sealed. He is protected. He has divine protection about him from this world. I thank God for that, folks. Amen. I'd hate to think I'd walk outside of this building today and have to deal with this spiritual world, this mess we're in, and have no protection from God. That'd be a horrible thing. Finally, the Apostle Paul said this, and I'll come to a close. He said, for to me to live is Christ. I'm going to break that down in three sections. For to me, section one. To live, section two, is Christ, section three. For to me, Paul said. In other words, I don't know what energizes you. I don't know what you're living about. I don't know what makes your life. But my life yeah. is Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Then he said, to live. I don't know how you live, but I live by Christ. Yeah. And then he finally said, for me to live is Christ. If ever a man lived on the face of this earth that was absolutely completely in love with the Lord Jesus... It was Paul. 
You know what you ought to pray for today? You ought to pray, Lord Jesus, build a fire in my soul again for my love for Thee. Amen. That I may love Thee again like I loved Thee before. Yeah. You know what He said to the church in the book of uh, Revelation, chapter number 2. He said, because thou hast left thy... That's right. And, the, and who's the first love? First love. First love. I got it all messed up the other day. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real master at math. I said we've been married 46 years, and I said we got married in 66. And some people quickly drew it to my wife's attention. He's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> they never have bothered me from the space agency to come out and help them with their quantum physics. <laughs> no, 48 years. This coming December the 9th will be 48 years since I took her as my bride. Amen. Amen. Been married since 1966. Hallelujah. Amen. It's been a good thing. It's been a good thing. I lived, I lived long enough without being married. And, uh, and then, of course, when I saw her, I don't know if you've ever heard my story or not. I was in on leave. I'd been in Okinawa f uh, 14, 15 months. I've been away, folks. Okinawa's right, right down below Japan. I've been over there for 15 months. I came back to the States, and I was on leave, didn't know where I was going. I figured I'd either be going to Camp Lejeune on the East Coast or Pendleton on the West Coast. I didn't know. hadn't got my orders yet. The reason I was home is because my grandfather was sick, and I had emergency leave because my grandfather raised me. And so I was home on emergency leave. I took my uniform and stuff down to the dry cleaners to get it cleaned. And while I was in there, in walked this girl. I said, hold on, son. <laughs> I said to one of my buddies, who is that? <clears throat> and that's when it started. It didn't take long. Uh, she swept me off my feet. And, and folks, believe it or not, we were married within, I forget now exactly how long it was, three weeks. If I'd known we'd be married so long, we'd dated longer, you know, and get to know each other. A lot of people, three weeks, we were married. Amen. So, you know, there's no, there's no set thing. There's, you know, there's no cut in stone about how relationships ought to start. And I think John Whitaker, didn't he? Your daddy, didn't he know, know your mother only about three or four weeks? And they were married how long before the Lord took him home? Fifty years? Fifty-five. I went to one of their anniversaries. Her daddy was married to, uh, to her mother for 55 years, and they only knew each other about three weeks before they got married. It can work. Amen. It can work. Why? Because I love her. God build within my soul love. I can't help but believe that if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to love other people. I just believe it. I believe it. You love Him and you're going to love other people because that's pure love. That begets love. So say, Lord Jesus, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to uh, rekindle my love. I've, I've, I've drifted away from my first love, and I don't feel good about it, and I, I don't like it, and I want it rekindled into my soul. Be careful what you ask for. He has a way of answering prayer. Roger Lee told me a few minutes ago, he said, he said, the Lord has answered three prayers for me this week. Now, he does it sometimes. You'll go through a dry spell and nothing happens, and all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, bang, 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 bang. You'll have all these prayers answered at one time. Three of them. Thank God for it, brother. Father, in Jesus' name, use what I've said for the glory of God, and I'll bless you and praise you. In thy sweet holy name I pray. Amen.